Now you take your Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter 5. It's page 906 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I want to say to you this listening out in the radio listening audience, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you're tuned to this station where you're now listening, you can get the daily broadcast at 12 noon each day, Monday through Saturday. And I hope you'll do that if you're not getting it already. And I want you to pray for me and write to me. I'm in need of hearing from the radio listening audience. So you let me hear from you next week. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. And you let me hear from you. And I appreciate that very much. Remember tonight at 730, we'll be speaking from Revelation chapter 13. We'll be talking about the two beasts, the beast, the false prophet. And we'll be talking about the mark of the beast. So I do hope that you will uh, be here tonight, bring your Bible, and follow me in the Word of God. Now in Daniel chapter 5, I'll read my scripture in just a moment. You know, we have today many things that said about paying visits to doctors and doctor's offices and so forth. Someone said more and more doctors are running their practices like an assembly line. One fellow walked into a doctor's office and the receptionist asked him what he had and he said shingles. So she took down his name and his address and his medical insurance number and told him to have a seat. Fifteen minutes later, a nurse, nurse's aide came in and asked him what he had, and he said shingles. So she took down his height, his weight, and a complete medical history, and told him to wait in an examining room. And then a half an hour later, a nurse came in and asked him what he had. He said shingles. So she gave him a blood test and a blood pressure test and an electrocardiogram and told him to take off his clothes and wait for the doctor. An hour later, the doctor came in and asked him what he had. And he said, shingles. And the doctor said, where? He said, outside in my truck. Where do you want me to put him? <laughs> Daniel chapter 5. Begin reading in just a moment. I'm giving you time to find the place. As we read the scriptures, I'm going to speak to you today on the man that was weighed in the balances and found warning. I'm going to read only a few verses to conserve time. I'll be pointing out other verses as we move along in the message today. Now Nebuchadnezzar had built a great kingdom there in Babylon. He erected one of the great seven wonders of the world, according to the great historian in those days. And that was called the Hanging Gardens in Babylon. The reason he erected the beautiful Hanging Gardens in Babylon is because he had married a woman that lived in the mountains. And this was in the plains. And she became homesick for the mountains. So he had thousands and thousands of people that he had as slaves. He'd captured in other nations. And they labored for weeks and months and built this huge mountain called the beautiful Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It was built there near the site where the Garden of Eden once stood. And the, the site where Babylon and Nimrod the mighty hunter lived at one time. And where they built the Tower of Babel at one time. And so he was, of course, greatly enthused and filled with a great pride over the beautiful hanging gardens of Babylon, the beautiful city. And God humiliated him by bringing him down like an animal. And he humbled himself uh, before God, the Bible tells us. That was Nebuchadnezzar that did this. But the man we're going to talk about is his son or grandson, Belshazzar. Nebuchadnezzar had died and Belshazzar had taken over. And he was also a very wicked man. And we find in Daniel chapter 5 and verse 1, Belshazzar the king had made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine and commanded to bring in the gold and silver vessels, which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, 
And the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and of silver and of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and rode over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. I would like to read the following verses, but to conserve time to get the main thought of my message across. I, I won't read it. I want you to read it when you have time. But there was a handwriting on the wall. A hand came out and wrote on the wall. And there it wrote the great words on the wall that you find in verse 25. This is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tikel, you farsam. This is interpretation of the thing. Mini, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikel, thou art waiting the balances that found one him. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given the Medes and Persians. And then it said that same night in verse 30 was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. Now we want to find out just what happened here. And we want to find out why the handwriting there was written on the wall and what it meant. Now the Bible said that this kingdom, this man Belshazzar and his kingdom was weighed in the balances of God and found warning. Now we do know that Daniel, a great prophet of God, lived in, the, in Babylon at this time. He was brought there by Nebuchadnezzar when Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem. Daniel was a man that refused to compromise. You'll find that in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. He was a young man when captured and brought in, but he refused to compromise and bow down to the evils there in Babylon. Daniel was a praying man, and he searched the scriptures to find out God's plan for Israel. In Daniel chapter 10 and verse 2, it said, In those days, our Daniel was mourning three full weeks. And so he prayed and looked to God and prayed for three, four weeks. He was finding the answer to why they were there and when they would be delivered. In Daniel chapter 9 and verse 2, the Bible tells you there how long they would be there. He found out how long they would be there. And he knew the time was drawing nigh when they would be delivered from Babylon. At least a remnant would go back uh, to their homeland there in Jerusalem. And he was, uh, of course, the man that interpreted the handwriting. There was great trouble there in the land, in, in Babylon. And someone was sought after to interpret the handwriting. And no one could do it until the queen remembered there was such a one as Daniel. At this time, Daniel, no doubt, had grown much older. But he was God's man and God's prophet. And kindly hid away, seemed to there in Babylon. But he was brought forward to interpret the handwriting. We find that the soothsayers could not do it. And so Daniel came to interpret the handwriting. And the moment he walked on the scene and saw the handwriting on the wall, he recognized that to be the handwriting of his Father in heaven. He could understand it. The Bible says the natural man cannot understand the spiritual things of God, neither can he know them. They are spirits to discern. Now he understood his Father's handwriting. Now there's a few things I want to say about the great city of Babylon. And you follow me closely as I pass these thoughts on to you. Now around the great city of Babylon, of course, was a huge wall that, that, that closed in the city. And there was a river that ran down through the middle of Babylon. The river Euphrates, 60 feet wide, 15 miles in each direction. A 60 mile wall was built around the city four square. This city was 700 feet thick at the bottom, 300 feet at the top, and it was 300 feet high. Quite a city, quite a wall city. But there's no wall city but what God can't break through and God can capture if he so desires. Now on top of this wall, six chariots with six horses each could run abreast on top of the wall. So remember, it was 700 feet thick at the bottom, 300 feet at the top, and it was 300 feet high. It had another outside wall, 200 feet high, separated by a moat of 50 feet of water. Now soldiers stayed on this wall. They remained on this particular wall, and they could cross over from the main wall to the small wall by a jackknife bridge, and every 14 feet they had a pot of hot lead to throw on the enemy when he came near. 
Now this is somewhat of a city. They thought was protected so that no one could break in, no one could capture them. And so they had the huge wall, and then on the outside the small wall, and then the moat of water on the, between the two walls, and the jackknife bridges, so they could draw those bridges when the enemy tried to conquer them. Now in the center of the city was a great temple of Baal, and young virgins of Babylon would stand around there and offer their virtue for sale, and give the price to Baal for their life's offerings. Now think about that. As many as 10,000 at a time stood around uh, this image of Baal. As many as 10,000 young virgin women there in this city would stand around uh, this tower of Baal and offer their virtue for sale. And the money they received, they gave that uh, for their life's offering. That was considered an offering for lifetime. Now on the inside of the city of Babylon, they had a dining room one mile long and a quarter of a mile wide and with hanging flowers hanging around this dining room. They had 1,000 beautiful lamps of gold hanging in this dining room. Now remember, this was a huge city, 60 miles square, and they had provisions on the inside of that city could last 25 years. Not only that, but they could grow much of their produce on the inside of the city of Babylon. So it was a beautiful, beautiful dining hall. And they had tables on the inside of Babylon in horseshoe shape. Now they had many lords there in that kingdom. Belshazzar was the ruler thereof, but many lords, of course, under him. And the lords and their wives would be served by a special Ethiopian waiter with golden carts drawn by 25 trained peacocks harnessed with golden and silver harness. Can you imagine these Ethiopian waiters dressed up so beautifully? And these golden carts with the uh, beautiful uh, peacocks bringing the food down to each table. And those tables were in a horseshoe shape. And then the Lord himself would sit at the end of the table, at the curve of the table. And then it extended back from him. And his most favorite wife would sit directly across in front of him. And his less favorite concubines would sit on either side as he would face them as he sat at the curve of the table. Now they were having a great banquet there that night. Now the reason they were putting on this particular banquet is because Darius the medium had been trying to capture Babylon for a number of months, even years. He had sent his soldiers in and tried to capture the city but could not. And so they found that the Babylon they, that Darius had thought had pulled back and had given up and had gone back home with his troops. Therefore, they announced the news to Belshazzar. They said, our enemy is given up. He's left. He's took his men and he's gone. We need not fear anymore. Oh, Belshazzar said, now is the time to celebrate. I want all the lords to call their wives and concubines together. I want you to get the wine ready. We're going to have a ball tonight. We're going to have a wonderful time. We're going to celebrate the fact that nobody, nobody, no army, no people can capture the beautiful city of Babylon. And so they pitched a party that night. In fact, all the guards that stood at the walkways that led up away from the, the river Euphrates that ran down to the middle of the city, all the guards that stood watch, they pitched a big drunk. Everybody seemed to have gotten drunk that night, both men and women. But in the dining hall is where they had the real banquet. That's where the liquor flowed and where they danced and carried on in a very sinful and wicked way. Now the Lord would sit at the table with his favorite wife opposite him and his less two favorite wives facing each other there at the table and they had from 50 to 350 wives and concubines lined up there at each table. They were getting ready for a great banquet. Now when the Lord wished to make a toast to the king, he would mount a special staircase and ride it out. He'd go up on the staircase on the platform inside of Belshazzar and many of the lords, and he would write out the toast to Belshazzar. Now when this particular lord would go up and write out the toast, when he wrote the toast out, the first thing would take place, the bugler would blow his trumpet. When the bugler blew his trumpet, then they knew then to fill the Lord's goblet with wine, and that they did. And then at the second blast of the trumpet, everybody stood up. 
at the third blast of the trumpet, uh, there the Lord himself would take a sip out of the goblet. And when he would take a sip out of the goblet, then he would take the remainder of that wine in that goblet and pour it into the breast of the woman sitting direct in front of him, his special, his most loved wife. And as soon as her clothes were saturated, she would immediately strip and become nude. Now this honor, of course, was designed by all the special wives of the Lord's. The sooner they were saturated with that wine out of their Lord's goblet, then, of course, their clothes would be taken off. They would be standing there nude before their Lord directly in front of him. They were all in a drunken stupor, and the party was raging. And then all of a sudden, someone came to Belshazzar, and they said, Oh, King, live forever. I have a suggestion. He said, Say on. Why don't you go to the house uh, why don't you go to the, to the uh, vessel, take, go to the uh, place where you keep the vessels that are taken from the house of God over in Jerusalem when your father Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem and brought all those beautiful golden and silver vessels that God had given to the nation of Israel for the temple. God had given them vi through visions and dreams exactly how to design those beautiful golden vessels that were placed in the temple there in Jerusalem. They were holy vessels. They were sanctified vessels. They were vessels that God had given them for the temple. They had designed them in a special way. They were of gold and silver. And when Nebuchadnezzar captured Jerusalem, of course, he brought all of these beautiful vessels out of the temple back to Babylon, and he had them stored away. And when they suggested that they go get these golden and beautiful vessels and bring them into the banquet hall and there drank their wine out of them, old Belshazzar with bleary eyes and a drunken stupor said, Wonderful! Wonderful! Bring them in! And they brought the vessels of God, sanctified and holy vessels, brought them in and poured wine into those vessels. And when they filled those vessels of wine, the vessels of God, and began to drink, all of a sudden, there appeared a hand, just a hand on the wall where the Lord's usually mounted the staircase, and there where he wrote out his toast, there was a hand began to write. When that hand began to write, someone no doubt said, Look, Belshazzar, look, there's something unusual taking place. And he looked, and he saw a hand writing, but he could not read what was written there on that wall. The Bible said, Oh, Belshazzar was gripped in fear. It was a real fear. In verse 5 it said, In the same hour it came forth fingers of a man's hand, and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. A real fear gripped him. Secondly, it was a shocking fear. Not only was there a real fear, number one, in verse five, but a shocking fear in number six. Then the king's countenance was changed. He was shocked. He couldn't understand why that hand came out and wrote on the wall and nobody could read what was written. Not only was it a shocking fear, but it was a mental fear. In verse six, the Bible says his thoughts troubled him. He was greatly troubled because he saw the handwriting on the wall. Then number four, it was a physical fear in verse 6. And the joint of his loins were loose, and his knees smote one against another. There stood old Belshazzar now, a man was in a drunken stupor early, having a real ball, having a time there in the kingdom. And with those drunken lords and women and the dancing and what would have been taking place and carried on there in the, in the banquet hall. Now his knees began to smite one against another. There he was trembling. It was a physical fear. And then number five, it was an active fear. Look at verse seven. And the king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers and the soothsayers and the wise men. The old king said, something has happened here. We can't understand it. I want to know what's written on that wall. Bring in the astrologers. Bring in the soothsayers. Bring in the fortune tellers. Bring in the wise men. I want them to read that handwriting. They came in one by one. They looked at it. They said, sir, we can't read it. That's a strange language to us. We can't read that. One by one, they came by. They shook their heads. They said, we can't read it, sir. And old Belshazzar still trembling. 
uh, there with great fear as it gripped his heart, knew that God no doubt had done something unusual in a strange way and maybe it was pertaining to him. Finally, the old queen heard about it and the queen sent word to her grandson. She said to son, don't you worry. There's an old gray-headed independent Baptist preacher here in the kingdom. He can take care of the situation. He's not a compromiser. He's never been called on to speak at the Lions Club. He's never been called on to speak at the Kiwanis Club. He's never been called on to speak at the Ministerial uh, Minister, uh, Association. But beloved, he can interpret that right. Bring him in. Grandson Belshazzar, bring the old gray-headed preacher in. Because when your father was alive, many times, many times he interpreted dreams and he could tell your father the things he needed to know. Oh, Belshazzar, no doubt, began to calm down just a little. He said, you know, we'll never have this man Daniel to come and speak to any of our clubs. We'll never, never had him come and, and give the invocation any time at any of our games. And we'll never call him to come in and, and say a prayer just before our dance or our, the great ball that we participated in. And we have ignored this old gray-headed independent missionary Baptist preacher. Bring him in. Let's see what he can do. Oh, Daniel, the great man of God, he had been ignored. He was considered an old fundamentalist. He had considered too far to the right. He, he was considered as one that was a rabble-rouser. He considered as one that, that was a troublemaker. So they just ignored the old man of God because he had conviction. He didn't go along with the ecumenical crowd. He didn't go along with the charismatic crowd. He was a man of God that covered all the ground that he stood on. He said, bring that old white-headed prophet in here. If he can tell me what that writing is, I'll put a chain about his neck. I'll make him third ruler in the kingdom. After a while, through the doorway came a broad shoulder, man of God with long white beard down his belt, headed out like rye, long white hair, walking in, and there his eyes filled with the Spirit of God, came walking that building as calm as could be. Belshazzar said, uh, Daniel, I've heard about you, man. I'm glad to have you. I believe you come in for such a time as this. Can you read that handwriting on the wall? Daniel glanced around. He read immediately. That was his father's handwriting. No problem with him. The natural man can understand the spiritual things of God. Neither can he know them that spirits he deserves. Daniel said, yes, sir, your honor. I can read that. No trouble. I understand that. That is my father's handwriting. I know exactly what he's saying. Belshazzar said, preacher, I'm so sorry we've ignored you. We have never had you to come and speak in our socials. We have never had you to come and tell jokes and speak in our clubs and our lodges. And, and we have never invited you to come in and head up any of our associations and conventions. Preacher, I'm so sorry we've ignored you, but I know you've been a busy man. You've been doing a lot of praying down there in your office. You spent a lot of time on your knees. You've been searching the scriptures, sir. We just didn't want to disturb you is the reason we had bothered about inviting you in. But we we'll certainly appreciate if you would tell us what that writing is. Old Daniel with his broad shoulders standing up as straight as a wooden Indian turned his head. He said, yes, I can read that. That's no problem. That's my father's handwriting. I've seen it before. And he said, now listen, before I read that handwriting, I got a few words to say to you, sir. I want to preach your sermon. And old Belshazzar, trembling like a leaf, said, Yes, sir. Go ahead and say what you please. But said, If you read that handwriting on the wall, he said, I'll put a gold chain about your neck. I'll make you third rule in the kingdom. Daniel said, Keep your chain and keep your money to yourself. You can't buy me. I'm not for high. I'll read it. I'm going to tell you what God said. But he said, first of all, I want to tell you something, sir. You remember how your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar was filled with pride and he fell on a God and, and he knew that God held his very breath in his hands and yet he wouldn't repent, he wouldn't get right, he wouldn't like, do right, he wouldn't, he wouldn't live right. And you know, Belshazzar, how God Almighty brought your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar down. He ate grass like an ox because of his pride. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Preacher. Yes, sir. I, I remember that about my granddad. I'm awfully sorry that he did that. I'm sorry that he didn't honor God. And, and Daniel said, that's not all, Mr. Belshazzar. He said, listen to me. He said you knew what God did to your grandfather. And yet you went on knowing that God Almighty held your very breath in his hands. And you've ignored the God of heaven. And you've taken the golden vessels that came out of the house of God. You drank wine out of them. And the writing says, Mini, Mini, take care, you far son. Dark weighed in the palaces and found warning, Belshazzar, you're going to die. Now that's some message, wasn't it? Listen to me. That very night, Darius hadn't pulled his army away to go back home. Darius did you know, what anyone would do, a military genius, in order to conquer a city like that. Around that wall of Babel at one time, the river Euphrates run. But whenever they built Babylon, they opened up a new river that ran under the wall on the upper side and out at the lower side. They covered up the old riverbed on the outside. Darius said, I know what I'll do. I'll dig out that old riverbed. And he put all of his troops digging. They dug out the riverbed all the way around the building, around the city. And then whenever they dug the old riverbed out, except a little opening at the top, a place where they kept, of course, uh, the wall there to keep the water from going around the old riverbed. And then Darius said to his men, I want you to pull back into the forest. I want them to think that we had given up. And so when he pulled his troops back into the forest, they thought, Belshazzar and his group thought they had given up. That's why they were pitching that party. When nightfall came, Darius brought his men. He broke that wall. He turned that water around on the outside of Babylon down the old riverbed. And when the water had abated enough around, going around the old riverbed, it left an opening under the wall at the top where the river had run under the wall. And Darius and his troops moved in. They went under that wall in the riverbed where the Euphrates had run, the beautiful Tile River. And when they walked in, they found the guards all drunk. His soldiers killed them ere they came to him. Darius himself went in. He went straight to that banquet hall. He walked into that banquet hall. There stood Belshazzar in a drunken stupor. Daniel had just said, Dark weed in the palace and foul warning. Tonight you're going to die. Darius walked in. He walked up behind Belshazzar. He grabbed around the neck. He took his dagger. He came back with that dagger through the heart of Belshazzar. And Belshazzar died in his own blood that night. Darius the Median took over the kingdom. And the handwriting said, Mini, Mini, TKL, you farsed. Thou art weighed in the palaces and found warning. Your sins have been too great. They have outweighed the goodness. And God is going to call you in to give an account. And tonight you're going to die and die he did. And died in his own blood. Today there's men and women weighed in God's palaces. There's cities being weighed in God's balances. One of these days, the scale's going to tip in the other direction. And when it does, it'll be too late. Great Babylon went down. Great Rome went down. Germany went down. Japan went down. Other great nations gone down. Men, kings, and rulers have been weighed in the balance of God and found warning. Individuals have been weighed in the balance of God and found warning. The Bible says, Dart weighed in the balances and found warning. If you don't have Jesus Christ in the scales with you, you're in bad shape. One of these days, the scale's going to tip in the wrong direction. You're going to open your eyes in the flames of a burning hell. You must have Jesus in your heart or you're not going to heaven. Thou art weighed in the balances and found warning. They tell me when they built the great Titanic, they began to load that boat to make a maiden voyage. Some of them said, well, at last we'll build a ship that God Almighty himself can't sink. On the way over, you know the story, it hit an iceberg. Someone said, Captain, Captain, yonder's iceberg. He said, let her move on, let her move on. Someone said, we got a ship that God himself can't sink. 
Somebody said, Captain Jonas Iceberg. He said, let the ship move on. About that time they hit that iceberg, you know the story. As they went down, the band was playing, near my God to thee, near my God to thee. We have built a boat that God can't sink. Don't kid yourself. There's no boat, no wall, no city, no nation. What God can't bring down. Let's stand. Our Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you take the message today, that you use it to thy glory, that you speak to every heart, Someone you lost, backslidden, and need to join the church, I pray you might move upon their hearts as we give this invitation today. If someone in the radio listen audience that need to be saved right now, I pray that you speak to their hearts. I pray for thy people that are backslidden. I pray for all who is my duty now to remember in prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen to me. The ladies are going to play on the instruments. Now listen closely. As they play, if you're here unsaved, if you're here backslidden, if you're here and you want to join this church, if you'll come forward, we'll help you. Or for any other reason, you may feel free to come if God is speaking to your heart. So come right on while they play a couple of standards. speaking when you come just walk right down here and let us help you we'd be glad to if you need to get saved come back to God and join the church he said to Belshazzar Lord weighed in the balance and found warning you never know when those scales may be tipped you'll go out in eternity Are they tilting now in the wrong direction? Better get Jesus in there with you. Those scales unbalanced, you head off in the other direction, hell's your destination. If it tilts in the right direction and you got Jesus with you, heaven will be your destination. How about it? <laughs> 